and they've lined in four people deep. Well, they have seen and witnessed something this afternoon which is going to be talked about for many years in the sport of cycling, for many years in the history of the Tour de France. So we already know that we can get extra information from the isotopic abundance of a mass spectrum. But this topic here is something that goes even beyond that. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story here because I wasn't even aware that this thing existed. It's pretty cool. So we're talking about C13 carbon isotope ratio mass spectrometry. I'll show you some applications dealing with forensics analysis. So we are going to talk about the instrumentation that's used to perform this particular type of analysis. But before that, I'm also going to talk to you about the C13 delta notation, which describes a way of presenting the variation in carbon abundance. I'm also going to give you some of the origins for this. In other words, why the abundance varies so we can take advantage of it. And then we'll talk about the applications of this as well. So I will mention that C14 is an isotope of carbon that's radioactive. And that isotope can be used for carbon dating, so to figure out how old something is. That absolutely has nothing to do with this topic here. Now that topic makes use of this kind of machine, an accelerator mass spectrometer. We'll talk about that later in the course, just not today. All right, let's just share a little bit of a background that got me interested in this topic in the first place. The fellow in the yellow jersey over there, that's Lance Armstrong. So he's kind of famous, or I should say infamous, for winning the Tour de France, since it's the biggest cycling race uh, that the world has, but then for being stripped of his titles uh, because of a well-known drug scandal. So he was caught uh, taking illicit substances that, that banned him from the sport. But I don't want to talk to you about him. It's actually the fellow that's next to him. That's Floyd Landis. Now, Floyd Landis was a teammate of Lance Armstrong, and he was kind of embroiled with the whole topic of doping and things of that nature. And let me just show you this performance here. They've lined this road for the last 24 kilometers, and they've lined it four people deep. Well, they have seen and witnessed something this afternoon which is going to be talked about for many years in the sport of cycling, for many years in the history of the Tour de France. Floyd Landis comes home. Now, what's amazing about this performance is that it followed on the footsteps of like one of the worst performances that he had just the day before. He was winning the Tour, and then he had this terrible day. But then he came back the next day with this remarkable feat, and he basically won the Tour off of that. And people were saying, how can you do it? Well, sometimes when things are too good to be true, they actually are. So the thing with sports, especially around this time, not just cycling, but there was a rampant amount of drugs being used. And it was basically whatever you can take and get away with. So I'm not saying that Floyd Landis was the only person taking drugs. I'm saying that if he wasn't taking drugs, he might have been the only person that was clean. So very quickly, the stories came out that Floyd Landis had failed a drug test. So he, he was detected with testosterone in his system, and the articles were claiming that it came from an exogenous source. In other words, our body makes testosterone naturally, but the testosterone in his body was unnatural. What does that mean? Well, chemically speaking, these two things are exactly the same. One is produced by nature, one is produced as a chemical process, but chemically, even the stereochemistry is exactly the same. And it really got me wondering, like, how do they even figure out the difference? These molecules are identical. Once it's in your body, how would you know the difference? So that got me looking into this topic here. So let's actually begin with this. The abundance of carbon-13. I showed you this table in a previous video, and it lists that the abundance of carbon-13 is about 1%. Now that about 1%, I do have to say about because it actually varies quite a bit. So depending on the source of carbon, you can have a little bit more or a little bit less. So you see the variation varies, well, okay, not by much, but it does vary from sample to sample. So this is what we're gonna take advantage of. This carbon 13 ratio is going to precisely measure exactly what the abundance of carbon is. And it will use that as a fingerprint to be able to tell the source or the origin of that material. It, it doesn't even seem possible, but I'll explain to you how it works. So first, this uh, C13 delta notation. Now, now you could list the absolute abundance of C13, 1.105%. But rather than do that, they put it on a relative scale. So the ratio of the difference between uh, the, the abundance of our sample against a reference material is actually how we report it. Now, what is the reference material? They just happened to pick something that had a very high level of carbon-13, and the source is this mineral deposit. It's, it's actually a fossil. They call it PD belenite, which is those critters over there. Um, but it's just it doesn't matter what it is. The point is that that is the standard material. It has a set concentration. 
of, of C13, but we now just by definition call that a delta of zero because when you compare it to itself, the difference is nothing. So we can plot the delta notation on a scale. So these are different sources of carbon material and you see that there's quite a variation when you compare it to that reference material. So for example, you've got like atmospheric methane, petroleum down at the negative side, and then the biological material, C3, C4 plants, whatever that is, um, varying a little bit closer to the reference material. So let me just explain this a little bit more. When you're thinking about the carbon cycle, you're talking about taking atmospheric CO2 and incorporating it into plants. So this is obviously a photosynthesis route that we're dealing with here. But the thing is that different plants will incorporate CO2 in different ways. So that's what we call these C3 versus C4 plants. So specific examples here, your C3 plants, you got things like wheat and soy, whereas C4 plants, corn and sugarcane. So they're just different kinds of plant matter. Of course, we eat this stuff quite commonly, but it incorporates CO2 from the atmosphere in a slightly different way. That also means that it changes the C13 abundance. So when you plot it on a delta scale, you see a very big difference when you're collecting a whole bunch of plants. C3s are more negative than the C4s. So of course, we eat these plants, and this is really interesting. You can actually see a difference in the diet just by looking at the cultures of people. So Europeans have this diet that's, well, less sugary, less corn syrup, right? North America is all about the corn syrup. So we seem to pick up a lot of the C4 um, in, an, in the amount of candies that we, that we pick up. So that actually gives us a slightly more positive uh, C13 abundance. So now you can see how we're starting to take advantage of the fact that we have different materials. If there's anything inside of your body that you produce naturally, well, it should have the same carbon-13 signature as the rest of you. But if the, that carbon source was like a petroleum product, it has a very different carbon-13 ratio than your diet. So that's what we're going to be measuring. Now, for mass spectrometry to do that properly, we need to get a very precise measurement. So the carbon-13 ratio is only like 1% for every one carbon. But what we're really after here is to know exactly what the percentage is to like three or four decimal places. Making that measurement where the abundance scale is known exactly right requires some special instrument. On top of that, no matter what the source of carbon is, it's a different molecule. So we have to kind of neutralize that fact. All the different masses need to be measured under one single scale. We're going to take that quite easily just by burning all of this material so it all turns back into CO2. So I'm going to walk you through the instrumentation that it takes to do C13 analysis right now. So actually it's a combination of a couple of different instruments. We have gas chromatography coupled to a combustion cell and then mass spec on the back end. So here's our GC system. The gas chromatography's goal is to just separate compounds. Now obviously if you're looking at a biological system, so a a blood sample, for example, where you're extracting all these compounds, there's going to be many in there. So if we want to, in, to just look at testosterone, for example, you have to be able to pull that out away from the rest. After that, we move to the combustion chamber. So without going too much in detail, you just take your organic compound, you heat it up with a catalyst, and then you produce CO2 at the back end. It's the CO2 that we're going to capture and measure. So the CO2 actually gets concentrated in this little trap here. So you can think of it like a coal trap that grabs the CO2. And then we can pass that on to a mass spectrometer where we're going to do the detailed analysis from there. So here's just a picture of the combination, the GC coupled to mass spectrometry and a combustion cell within it as well. Okay, I am going to say that like this type of instrumentation is something we'll cover in a lot more detail later on in the class, but now seems like a good a time as any to explain very briefly how it works. This is a magnetic sector, and the goal is to start with our compounds at one end and then pass them over the magnet where they bend depending on the mass and they hit the detector at the other side. The detector that we're using is called a Faraday cup, which is just a way that precisely counts how many ions that we have. So imagine now that we have our CO2 because we burned our compound and it either carries the C13 or the C12. So they're, all, they're both going to start at the starting point and we're going to push them through where the magnet is going to bend that path and they'll hit the Faraday cups at the other side. So the, the motion will look like this and the rule is that the lighter the compound, the more that it bends. So you see the C12 the pink ball is the one that's bent the furthest. 
So the Faraday cup is simply counting the concentration, the, ab the abundance of ions, and then plotting out the total. All right, so that's how it works in a nutshell. As I said, we'll go through this in, in further classes. I just wanted to go through a couple of quick examples of how you can use it. So this is kind of a neat one, uh, looking at, at counterfeit honey. So I mentioned that the North American diet is full of corn syrup, and you'd see how easy it would be to just throw some corn syrup into honey, or maybe a small percentage of it, just to cut down from that expensive product and sell us this cheaper material. So how can you tell the difference? Well, as I mentioned, it's because the corn, being a different type of plant, has a different carbon-13 abundance, so we'll be able to tell that difference from the natural abundance that it should be for honey. So an example of the data here, now you're looking at chromatograms that's showing the different types of sugars that are being separated, and we're actually monitoring the CO2 because all of these sugars are ultimately burned down. So we're monitoring the CO2 at different mass channels, 44, 45, 46, depending if it has carbon-13 and we're being able to plot out the abundance. I won't go through the details of it, but let's just say that once you've analyzed these plots, you can tell the carbon-13 abundance, and you can tell that in one sample it must have been spiked with a higher concentration of rice syrup than the regular honey is supposed to have. So that's a fake honey sample. Now another interesting example is the application of isotope ratio mass spectrometry to kind of geographically locate um, drugs or things of that nature. So all these drugs are growing in different soils, different regions, and that soil can have a different isotope signature than another soil, another part of the, of the world. So sorry for the resolution here, but what you can tell is that the carbon isotope ratio for these drugs, morphine and heroin, they are different depending on where they're being grown. So if you have like a drug seizure, then you could do this type of analysis and you could kind of figure out what the ratio is and then localize that to where this drug would have come from. Now I didn't mention this before, but the carbon ratio can be extended to other isotopes. So what you're looking at here is a nitrogen isotope ratio, which is being plotted as a second dimension to kind of further separate along with the carbon isotope ratio. So here you're looking at the nitrogen content as well as the carbon content and seeing that distribution depending on geographic location. So you're able to separate and localize exactly where these drugs have come from just by measuring the carbon or nitrogen ratios. So this is really a powerful tool. And in terms of the instrumentation, it's actually not that fancy. In other words, it's not too expensive. So once you have this type of instrument, you could use it for food authentication. For example, looking at where grapes have grown to decide if it's, it's the right type of wine or not. I mean, you know, some bottles of wine are really expensive, right? Um, what else? You could look at explosives, same idea, being able to trace back where they might have been, where, where they might have been manufactured. And I didn't even touch how far deep we can go in with, with sports doping, but all of these compounds, um, there's so much control over that now because athletes are always trying to find a way to cheat the system. So we have to have tight controls over it. And there you go, that's all I can tell you for now. Um, I do find this a really fascinating topic and I hope you find it fascinating as well. It just goes to show that just because you've got a, this instrument that measures peak height, that's not all you can do with it, right? So like once you have this idea of taking advantage of the natural variation of carbon abundance, it just comes down to common sense to put these instruments together. All right, hope you enjoyed that topic. We'll see you next time. Floyd Landis comes home, his first ever stage win in his fifth Tour de France. He's had three yellow jerseys this week, but he hasn't never dreamt he'd get another one. And now he's made it possible before the finish in Paris to win this race.